What's up, strategic investors? We're here to bring you breaking news regarding cryptocurrency and macroeconomics in a simple way that's easy to understand. This is one of the most volatile periods of history in the last several hundred years. Economics and cryptocurrency has never in history been as important to understand as it is today. We're looking to build a community of some of the brightest minds in all of finance. Asset management is like a game of chess and we're always looking to stay one move ahead of the competition. Subscribe to our channel to become a part of the most comprehensive upcoming communities in cryptocurrency and economics. So enough with that, let's get to the content you all came here to see. In this video, we're going to be talking about the United States' industrial production stagnation over the last 20 years and how that ties in with GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, and NAFTA. The GATT has become what is known as the World Trade Organization, the WTO, today. So you can see that this is a chart. This is the FRED, the St. Louis Fed.org, and the chart is industrial production, the total index. And you can see down here, the industrial production index is an economic indicator that measures real output for all facilities located in the United States manufacturing, mining, and electric and gas utilities. So if we look at the chart, you can see that it had a nice steady uptrend till about the year 2000. And it was in that uptrend since about the mid 30s. And this is a really important chart because it measures our ability to produce goods. The production of goods and services is actually a better measure of how efficiently an economy is actually performing so you can see from this chart that we actually haven't produced really any more goods in the United States since about the year 2000. We have produced a little bit more, but for the most part, this has been majorly a consolidation range. So in this video, we're going to talk about how it feels that we are actually becoming a more wealthy society when we are not producing any more goods here in the United States. And we're also going to talk about how this is actually probably pretty unsustainable. And I think we're getting to the point where it's going to come to a head where it's actually going to become a more relevant problem here in the near future. So that might raise the question, what happened around the year 2000 that could have spurred this action to actually happen? So let's come over here. So you can see that in 1945, World War II ended. And before World War II, there was the Great Depression. So people from this era had just spent the last decade or two going through two of the biggest crises in recent history. So the people in this era knew what it was like to face global tensions and a failing economy. So coming out of World War II, if we come over here, you can see that on October 30th of 1947, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was signed. The agreement contained tariffed concessions agreed to during the first multilateral trade negotiations and a set of rules designed to prevent those concessions from being frustrated by restrictive trade measures. And you can see at the time there were 23 nations that were signed up. So really this was designed to promote global trade. And then if we come over here, you can see that on January 1st of 1995, the World Trade Organization, the WTO, replaced the GATT, which had been in existence since 1947 as the organization overseeing the multilateral trading system. And then a few years after the GATT became the World Trade Organization, so you can see here on November 15th of 1999, the United States and China finally signed a landmark agreement on China's accession to the World Trade Organization. So I want to point out that it originally started with 23 nations. And then by 1994, it had grown to 128 countries. And then by 1999, China was included. And China is significant because its population is so large. So there's a pretty good interview from 1994 with a guy named Sir James Goldsmith. And he talks a lot about all of this as it was happening. And he does a great job of warning of exactly the problems that this would cause and has caused. So I thought it would be really relevant to actually watch this with you guys 
and then we can stop it along the way and make comments as interesting things are being said. So with that, let's start the video. We begin with Sir James Goldsmith. He is known for many things, the money he has amassed, the companies he has owned, the battles he has fought, the women he has loved, and the issues he has taken. He has been controversial, but frequently he has been right. He's one of the people in 1987 who saw the stock market coming down, and he forecast the crash of 87 in October. He also saw the rise in oil prices with OPEC coming together. He now believes that GATT is wrong for the industrialized world and that it will unleash a series of problems that will be catastrophic for the world. It is all contained in a new book that he's written called The Trap, and I am very pleased to have Sir James Goldsmith join us for the beginning of this conversation. Welcome. Thank you. It is a pleasure to have you here. Why is GATT bad at a time that uh, many people believe that NAFTA has proven, despite all the warnings, to be good for the United States and good for Mexico? All of the fears that Ross Perot and others forecast didn't happen. Now, you come along and say, that was very small. GATT is much larger. It will unleash an unemployment that will attack the economies around the world. What's the thesis that makes you believe that? Well, of course, NAFTA and GATT have totally different sizes. NAFTA was a free trade area with Mexico and Canada, where it wasn't just economic. It was regional problems. You've got all sorts of neighborly problems that you have to solve between, between the three nations. But it's nothing. It's like Portugal and Greece was for us in Europe. What we're talking about in St. Vincent for GATT, we're talking about a free trade area with China, with India, with Vietnam, with Indonesia, with four billion people. You see, when GATT, this last round, this is the eighth round of GATT, started eight or nine years ago, the negotiations, the old way round. When it started, the world was a completely different place. Since then, You've had four billion people who before were set aside, if you like, by held, held away from us by communism, by other ideologies, and they've all of a sudden joined the free market. Fine, that's fine. Secondly, those people have got massive unemployment. So I just wanted to pause it there and just give a little bit of background information on what has happened in China since this interview. So he mentioned that China had a pretty bad unemployment problem at the time. And at the time, the majority of people were actually living as farmers. So as you started to shift the manufacturing from the United States over to China, that actually incentivized a lot of people to come in from the countrysides into the city. And the rate at which people were actually moving from the countrysides into the city was at such a fast rate that the cities and infrastructure that China had established couldn't support it. So over the last several decades, China's been trying to build up its infrastructure and it's been building a whole bunch of mega cities to try to keep up with the population growth in the cities. And this is something that has actually contributed to their real estate problem out in China. They ended up building way too much and now there's a lot more supply than demand. And there's actually some pretty large cities that are inhabited in China. So that actually does play somewhat of a role in companies such as Evergrande defaulting on loans as of recently. While that doesn't explain the whole story behind Evergrande, I just thought it would be important to point out that his perspective is about the United States, but there's actually some interesting things that have went on in China also regarding these decisions. So I don't think we're going to watch this whole video. As you can see, it's 56 minutes long. I should have mentioned that to start out with. We'll watch maybe another couple minutes but this is a great interview, so if you do have time, definitely come check it out because it does give a lot of background information on a lot of the different things that are happening with the economy at the moment. And it's always interesting just to see people make such accurate predictions so far into the future. I just think it's a great interview to watch in its entirety. So if you guys have time, might as well come check it out. But let's watch a couple more minutes and then we can move on with some other topics regarding what he's talking about. So, with that, let's start the video back up. Secondly, those people have got massive unemployment. They have very fast-growing populations. They work for almost nothing compared to our populations. I mean, you can employ 47 people in Vietnam and the Philippines for one American. But that's what they said about NAFTA, too. Well, well yes, because you're talking about 4 billion people. Right. You're not talking about 80, 80 million people. And quite apart from that, 
The idea that you can judge the results of NAFTA so far, in my view, is a bit naive because it's only been a few months. So let's wait in five years and see what's happening. But first, let's talk about GAP. Four billion people. You can employ them. Mexico's expensive labor compared to the other places. Now, what are the other changes that have taken place since your going around started? Technology can be transferred anywhere in the world. Capital can be transferred instantaneously wherever the return is highest. So I just wanted to pause it and point out that he mentioned that this is made a lot more efficient by the fact that digital money can be transferred overseas a lot easier. Currently, we're using the SWIFT system, but the government's talking about creating a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, and this would make overseas payments even that much easier. We want to make a video about CBDCs here in the near future, so let us know in the comments if you'd like to see us make that sooner than later. But we think the CBDCs also are going to play a big role in how they intend to go about inflating the debt problem away. I think it's going to be a really relevant video, so I'm probably going to do it sooner than later anyway. So just wanted to mention that really quick, so with that, let's get back to the video. Now what are the other changes that have taken place since your going around started? Technology can be transferred anywhere in the world. Capital can be transferred instantaneously wherever the return is highest. So today, you are to take two companies, two corporations. They make the same product. To be sold in the same market, because the whole concept of global free trade is you can make a product anywhere and sell it anywhere. They have access to the same technology. They have access to the same capital. They only have one difference cost of labor. 47 to 1. So they move. Now what has been the result? We've, we've got some results. Some results are in. It isn't a hypothesis. You take France. Uh, in Europe we had uh, free trade started to emerge from 1973 onwards. That's when the Treaty of Rome was changed. During that 20 year period since then, the economy in France has grown by 80%. The number of unemployed has gone from 420,000 to 5.1 million. That's equivalent to 25 million in the States. Now, what is the good of having an economy that grows by 80% if your unemployment, the people excluded from active economic life, goes from 420,000 to 5.1 million? So I thought that would be a pretty good point to stop the video. Like I said, it's a pretty good video, so come check it out if you guys are interested. But basically what he was getting at there at the end is that why would you want to grow your economy if it meant that you were hurting a sizable portion of your economy? He's basically saying it's not worth raising the quality of life for some if you have to lower the quality of life for others. And while he mainly makes the point that this is going to feed into a pretty strong trade deficit throughout the rest of the video, you can also draw a conclusion that this has played into the wealth inequality that we see throughout the world today. So with that, let's move on and look at the U.S. trade balance. So the zero line on this graph would represent an equal balance between both imports and exports. And as we can see from this chart, the graph has trended downwards and we are below the zero line as the United States. So that would mean that the United States has a trade deficit. And this chart goes up until 2020, and it's showing that in 2020 our trade deficit was almost $700 billion a year. And this problem has got worse since this data on the graph. And we'll talk about that in upcoming web pages that we're gonna look at. But while we're on this chart, we should note that this problem really began to accelerate to the downside, which means that the United States trade deficit began to accelerate in the early 1990s. So as we began to export our labor to the rest of the globe, that meant that as a country, as the United States, we were producing less goods. So naturally, if we were producing less goods, we didn't really have as much to exchange to the rest of the world and sell to the rest of the world. So we've actually had to import a lot more than we've had to export over the last couple decades. So from the early 1990s to just before 2000s, you did have a gradual decrease in our trade balance, which means a increase in our trade deficit. And then the late 90s is where you begin to see things really start to pick up to the downside, and our trade deficit begin to really increase as a nation. And then around the year 2000, 
around the time China was being introduced into the World Trade Organization, that's where things actually began to really pick up even more, and the delta of this problem began to increase even faster. So from the early 90s to the late 90s, our trade deficit went from about just under balanced to about 100 billion in trade deficit, so negative 100. And then from the late 90s to around the year 2000, our trade deficit went from negative 200 billion down to about 400 billion, or negative 400 billion. And then around the year 2000, and as China was being introduced into the World Trade Organization, we went from about negative $400 billion a year all the way down to almost around negative $800 billion around the time of the Great Financial Crisis, at which we did recover for about the last decade. But after the pandemic of 2020, the problem really began to get worse again, and we actually made new lows in our trade deficit. So, after the pandemic of 2020, our trade deficit actually accelerated down to about a trillion dollars a year. So, let's take a look at how that relates to the rest of the world. So, if we compare the United States to the rest of the world, you can see that we by far have the largest trade deficit in all of the world. This chart is from 2019, so it's before the pandemic and before the trade deficit started to increase. So it's before the pandemic and before the trade deficit started to really pick up speed again. So keep in mind that as of today, our trade deficit is about a trillion dollars a year, whereas this chart is showing that it's about half a trillion a year. So to put that in perspective, you can see that the United Kingdom is about $120 billion a year, and Kenya is about $50 billion a year. So second and third place are nowhere even near where we're at on this table right here. And it's even worth noting that our trade deficit is about 10x higher than the third place, which would be Kenya. So we found ourselves in a pretty serious problem. So if we come over here, we can see that the trade deficit increased by 27% last year to an all-time high of $859 billion. It was at $676 billion in 2020. So if we scroll up, you can see that this is about 2021. But in 2022, we've actually reached a trillion dollars. And if we scroll down, I just want to point out that having a trade deficit increase 27% every year is a major problem. And I understand that this is just a single year and it's not every year. But if this problem continues at the rate it's going, it's going to become a major problem if it's not already. So I just thought it would be interesting to show you guys if we plug that into a compounding calculator just to see what that would give us. All right, so this is a compounding calculator and I plugged in 859 because that's the amount of trade deficit that we have. And I plugged in 27% as the interest rate and we're gonna run it for 10 years and we're gonna compound the returns. So after 10 years, you can see that if we increase our trade deficit by 27% a year, that would put us at over $9 trillion a year. And as you can see, this would quickly become unsustainable at the rate we're going. So with that, let's come over here. So this site is the usdebtclock.org. And I really just want to point out our revenue versus federal spending. Our federal spending is over $7 trillion a year, but our federal revenue is just over $4 trillion a year. So you can see that we're spending about almost double what we're bringing in. We talk more about this in a previous video that we put out. It's titled The Government Debt Problem Explained. So if you're interested in hearing more about the details regarding this, go ahead and check that out. We'll leave a link for you. So I just want to point out that, as you can see, we're spending a lot more than we're bringing in already. So if we have to print the difference or issue more debt to go out and support our trade deficit, that's actually gonna make the problem a lot worse. And that's why a lot of people refer to the twin deficits as becoming such a problem. And the twin deficits refer to both our trade deficit and our budget deficit. And this is because the problems really do feed on each other. And we actually just made a video also describing the current inflow outflow situation regarding our trade deficit and the euro dollar market. It's titled, Tech Stock Rotation Could Be Bad for Dollar. So if you're interested, go ahead and check that out. We'll also leave a link for that one. And referring back to the interview that we watched earlier with Sir James Goldsmith, where we decided to cut the video off, he was talking about how this problem would actually accelerate the wealth inequality in the United States. 
As you can see from this chart, it is a chart of the purchasing power of the US dollar. And the chart ranges from 1900 to 2020. So in 1900, the purchasing power of the US dollar was up at 100 on the chart. You can see that it really has been declining over the last century. As by the time we get to 2020, purchasing power is down to just over $3. So that suggests within the last 120 years, you've lost about 97% of your purchasing power. But that's like a whole lifetime and a half. So we can just break that down a little bit more. And if we look at the 70s, you can see that we've lost about 90% since the 70s, just under 90%. As in the 70s, you had about $20 worth of purchasing power. And by 2020, it was down to $3.06. So our purchasing power has already been eroded at such a high degree. And this problem is just going to make it that much worse. And it's really going to put a big pressure on society and the economy. So I thought this video would be really relevant as the trade deficit is so important to watch. I thought it would be nice to be able to go over the details to understand how we got to the point we're at today. So it'll be interesting to watch how we go about trying to reshore our manufacturing in the United States going forward, because that will have big implications for the economy going forward also. So with that, I think this is a good place to wrap up the video. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. We hope you all found this content valuable. If you did, like this video to let us know so we can continue to put out similar content. If you have any questions or comments, or if you have any suggestions regarding other topics you're focused on and would like to see us cover, just let us know in the comments below. And subscribe to our channel to become a part of the most comprehensive upcoming communities on all of YouTube. This economic environment only comes around once in a lifetime, and we're here to act like it. We're not here to talk you up. We're going to leave our emotions at the door and navigate these markets through the good and the bad. Keep in mind that this is not financial advice. This is more of a mastermind that we can all come together as a community and use each other's unique perspectives to better achieve logical conclusions. We really appreciate all of our team out there watching, and we look forward to continuing conquering these markets with y'all going forward. Until next time, stay one move ahead. Have a great day, everyone.